There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, I'm John the Book Maniac, and I'm here with Helen the Book Maniac. This is my mum. Hello, <laughs> mum. Hi. Hi, everybody. We have a beautiful backdrop for this video. We have a family heirloom, that beautiful wooden bench and mirror. Tell us about that. That belonged to Sean's dad's parents when they came to Grand Coulee, and it would be... Grandparents. Grandpa his grandparents, yeah. yes. It would be well over 100 years old, yeah. and it's... It was a hall seat, so there was the, the, the mirror with the hooks for, for uh, hats, and then the, the lid lifts on it to set book, uh, uh, coats and things. But that, that piece has never been refinished. It's just been kept like that. So and, it's, and the mirror has stayed really good. Yeah, the yeah. mirror stayed really nice in it. It's amazing. It's quite an antique. It is. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. so we cleaned her off, so it would be a nice backdrop today. <laughs> Uh, a few weeks ago, Mum had a very big birthday. Are we going to divulge the actual birthday number? Well, I guess we are, because why not? You're going to be shocked. You better sit down when I tell you. She <laughs> turned 80, and uh, I thought it would be a fun video to make, to talk about Mum's 80 years of reading. She's been an avid reader ever since she can remember. <laughs> and we're going to try to talk about at least one book from every decade of life. The first decade of life is a bit going to be... Sketchy. It, it's sketchy, because... Mm -hmm. <laughs> She doesn't remember too much. I don't remember the books, but I do remember reading, and I loved reading, yeah. So maybe what, where, what, we don't need to name the village or whatever, but what kind of a, where were you in your childhood? Um, small town. Small town, yeah. Saskatchewan. Went to school in a small town. Mm -hmm. Small town, Saskatchewan. Yeah, and I don't remember the books that we read, but I remember loving to go to school and reading everything that we had at school. And I do remember this, when I was in grade four, Every day after lunch, and of course many of you will remember that, we used to have the teacher read a story, and it was often a, a continued story, so it would be a novel or whatever. And our teacher in grade four wasn't very well, and so she started having the students read the story after lunch. Well, she did that for about three weeks, and then it was me. I read the story for the rest of the year, because I could read out loud and read so that everybody could understand it without halting and all the rest of it. So yeah, that's my grade four reading, remembering. <laughs> so it's the next decade to remember. that I remember. Well, we moved to Plenty, uh, we moved to- So this a, is we the moved, decade of the 50s, basically. Yeah, in the 50s, and I was 12. And I immediately became friends with a girl whose family were had a lot of books around for, for young people and for kids and teenagers and so on. And they introduced me to Anne of Green Gables. Well, I'm telling you, that just took off in my heart and my mind. And I had read Anne of Green Gables and they had the whole series. So they had Anne of Green Gables and Anne of Avonlea and Anne of the Island and so on and so forth. But you could order books from the Eaton's catalog then. And so, I saved up my money, and uh, the first book I bought out of the Eaton's catalog was Anne of Green Gables. And we still have that somewhere. We still have it, and I should have brought it. Yeah, that's all right. Anyway, yeah. and to this day, I love that book. Those books. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when I was a kid, we're, we're, we're making this video at the farm, I should have said that, and when I was a kid, Mom would read Anne of Green Gables to my sister and I on the back step of the bungalow house where we grew up. <laughs> which is just over there. And I remember the scene of Uncle Mac, was that his name? Matthew. Math, mm -hmm. Uncle Ma Matthew, Uncle mm -hmm. Matthew's dying. Mm -hmm. And it was my first experience in any kind of, in a movie or in a book or anything of death. And I was so fascinated, I made you read that page <laughs> to me over and over. I hope I didn't traumatize my sister. <laughs> but uh, it's a very, very strong memory. The story has been made into TV, programs more than once and did you enjoy those as well i love them yeah. they're a little different like they're not they're not the original elam montgomery but still i love them they yeah well, i still watch them mm -hmm. yeah. and with an e is the latest and with the e yeah it's very popular mm -hmm. in japan right now mm -hmm. oh okay yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, anne of green gables the book is incredibly popular in japan w all japanese women of a certain age i would say my age and up just are as addicted to it as you were. Just enthralled. 
it's such an important part of Japanese culture that they made a mini series about the Japanese translator who translated it. Oh, she's oh. famous in Japan. Oh, so yes, okay. it's a big deal in Japan. Um, yeah, that wasn't, but the play, I've seen the Anna Green Cables play six times in different places. Okay. We saw it in Charlottetown. You know, the first time that we ever saw it, I took you and Suzanne to Saskatoon to the TCU place, and we saw it on a Saturday afternoon, you and Suzanne and I. The and three I of us. And I don't remember you that. You don't remember that, but yep. Well, so where are we now? We're in the third, the third decade. decade. Yep. Um, 60s. 60s and very busy times we participated in. A, life was really more participatory. I don't think I read a lot, but I did read this. Uh, your dad's mom, my, uh, Grandma Mooney, had a subscription to the Reader's Digest condensed, condensed books. books. And she would get one a month. And so that was kind of my reading in the 60s that we read. And people of a certain age, younger than me, wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. So Reader's Digest, I think the magazine's still being made. They just condense stuff into smaller size. Paraphrases. Yeah, they, they had novels that, the, there were novels that were written, and they were, I guess they did a summary of them, and they were like a, a short story of about 50 pages, a lot of them. Yeah, so yeah and each... so it was books that were current, but that were summarized into a smaller... And so there'd be about five or six or five in or one six. in one monthly volume. Volume, yeah. yeah. Fake leather. Yeah, they were fake leather, and I, I don't know where they went to. Yeah, they were mm -hmm. a dime a dozen. They were all over the farm, but I don't yeah. haven't seen one for a long time. But no. yeah, they were yeah. very popular. And I read those all through the '60s for sure. That would be my reading. Because um, you, the, this, that was the year. That was the decade that you came to the farm mm -hmm. as a young married. A farmer's wife, right? And you came into a family that was a big reader. We family. did, we did, except for your husband. <laughs> well, he's always been a, a lot. He was a magazine reader, yeah. though. He yeah. liked westerns. But his dad like was a really a Shakespeare reader. Yeah. He would read Shakespeare in the middle of the night. His Shakespeare volume was leather bound and it was worn out. Yeah. And uh, Reg's Reg's mom read and read and read. And my mom was a reader, and my dad was a reader. And, of course, Sean and Suzanne arrived in the 60s, so we were busy with children. Yes. New babies. Mm-hmm. All right. So now we're, what is it now, the fourth Se decade? Yep, the fourth decade. The 70s. The 70s. Well, I do remember Taylor Caldwell. Taylor Caldwell. Caldwell. The Lion of... Um, oh, I can't remember the title. Uh, uh, the Great Lion The Great Lion of God. The, yeah, I like that book a lot. Red Taylor Calder and Pearl Buck. Pearl Buck. Pearl Buck. Those were the two that were kind of my favorites in the 70s. And I, I think Pearl Buck was a taste that you and Grandma Mooney shared. It was. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I finally read one of her novels, one of her her most famous novel, about five years ago, and quite enjoyed it. Yeah. Set in China. Yeah. Taylor Caldwell was um, The Captains and the Kings. Yeah, I read Captain. that one. And you know, I tried to read another one of her, I tried to read that. Oh, about three or four or five years ago, and I can't stand it. <laughs> no, no, I it's don't, really, think, I don't it's think Taylor Caldwell has aged well. <laughs> it's really funny. I thought it was great then, but now I don't, so that's okay. Uh, Anna Green <laughs> like Gables is a different story. Anna Green Gables is a different story. Yeah. And I think that by the 70s, you were a Book of the Month Club person, so there's always lots of books around. Yeah, there was lots of books around. I what kind of books were the Taylor Caldwell? I don't even think they're in print anymore. Well, the the, the Great Lion of God was about Paul, Paul a disciple, so yeah. And Captains and Kings. It it seems to me that Captains and Kings was kind of a novel that was a, a, a family saga. Yeah, I don't even really remember it. I remember reading it, but I don't remember what it was about. So now let's get into the eighties. <laughs> well, the eighties were a very different. Uh, two very separate parts because the the early part of the 80s shot the kids were older they were late teens busy in a lot of different things we were involved in that I was very very involved in the church at that point and I don't remember having a lot of time to read but I did read the series of the Jelna books one summer as a that was kind of like that was my holiday time and I liked I, went, I enjoyed them, and of course that was a family saga, okay, and there yeah. must have been eight books in that. And not famous today, so the Jelma books were written by Mazo de la Roche, or Ro Roche, a Canadian writer. It was a woman, wasn't it? It was a woman mm -hmm. writer, and mm -hmm. it's now 
come out that she was lesbian. But okay. there's nothing about that in the books. No. So this is a family saga over about five or six volumes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when were they written? Around well, that I, time, think, I think they were written long before that. Maybe the long before 50s that. Or 40s. Yeah, I think so. I ordered them, obviously, because I had the whole set. I remember they were a fake leather set. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Set where? So that's a Canadian story. Oh, they were in the east. East uh, Ontario or something? Yes, yes. They so were there's in, a Canadian. Yes, yeah. they were in Ontario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they were very Victorian. <laughs> I can remember they were English. They were that. It was that kind of um, setting, and that's how they lived. Yeah, mm -hmm. patriarchy. Wonder if those might stand up today. <laughs> Not likely. Not, Not likely. likely. So that was the first part of the eighties, and then in the second part of the eighties, I started to university in eighty five. So my reading completely changed. I started to read. I took a lot of English classes, and I wasn't reading for pleasure. I was reading for work or study for, <laughs> for for that. I read so much that that the, they thought that there was something wrong with my eyes because I had changed from <laughs> from looking long distance to reading that closely and they thought I had an eye disease because I was reading that much. That yeah. Thankfully it was a false alarm. <laughs> Fortunately. You know, I'll have to go back because there was a book that I had in high school that I absolutely adored. It was Kim by Rudyard Kipling. Oh, yeah. Just loved that book. I'd love to have it now and read it again. Okay. It was set in India. Uh, yes. And, and it was, there was just so much color and bounce and joy. And Kim was such a, he was a, he was a little rascal, but he was so smart. Was he a kid? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was a kid. A, mm -hmm. a British kid? No, or a no. Native Indian. But he Indian. kind of took advantage of all those English. Mm -hmm. That's the bread. I haven't, I haven't read Kim. Maybe we'll have to read that one together someday. Uh, we'll have to find it. Anyway, so back to the university ones. I don't, nothing really stands out in my mind. I just took a lot of classes and worked really hard. <laughs> it's a problem with studying that literature at university is that you, you don't have time to enjoy it. You mm -hmm. might have enjoyed it if you were reading it for your own self, but mm -hmm. well, we're into the 90s. Anyway. We're into the 90s, 90s, and by the 90s, I had graduated from university. I was working. I reread all the Anne books. <laughs> I bought them at Costco and reread them. But there's several novels. There are two or three that I really that stand out in my mind. One was "Can You Hear the Nightbird Call" by Anita Rabadami. Um, That's right, yes. Anita yeah. Rabadami. And that one really stood out in That's my an mind. Excellent novel. Yeah. And I read your copy and loved it too. Yeah. And I've met her. Yeah. Oh, you met her? Yeah. Oh, okay. I happened to, I went to the Vancouver Writers Festival. I was sitting in the audience. I didn't recognize her, but she was sitting beside me and we started talking and I think she said, what do you do? And I said, blah, blah, blah. I said, how about you? And she said, oh, I'm a novelist. Oh, really? Would I know your stuff? And it was Anita Rabadami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she was lovely. And another one that I really enjoyed that I read in the, in the 80s, in the 90s was Barbara Kingsolver. And I, and I liked I really liked the first four. They were really good. But the one that really stands out in my mind is the Poisonwood Bible. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed that book a lot, I think. We haven't agreed on that one, maybe, but I liked uh, it. I, I just thought the father was too much of a character, but other than that, I loved it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and my immediate reaction to it was that I loved it. But the more I thought about it over time, like, oh, I guess there's those kind of people in the world, but I just thought it could have been a little more nuanced, but no. <laughs> I disagree. I argue with lots of people about that. <laughs> so, uh, then, so Barbara Kingsolver has been a favorite writer of yours. Oh, a few yeah. misses, but mostly hits. I have, yeah. The, I didn't like the last one, but there were everything else she's written. I've read, read everything yeah. she's written. Yeah. So by this point, I was out of the closet. So you had a gay son, and you did read some gay novels too. Do you remember any of those? I remember Michael Cunningham. Kining, uh, that's the one. Michael Cunningham. Michael Cunningham, The End of the World. Uh, a home at the end. A of the home world. at the end of the world. I remember that one, and I kind of remember what that one was about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I did read other things too. I don't re recall what they were, but I did quite a lot of reading. You sure did. Mm -hmm. And so by this time, you were reading some Canadian writers, and some of them left you cold, and some of them you liked. But I, I, I remember the ones that left you cold. Margaret Atwood has not <laughs> been a favorite of yours. <laughs> I like Margaret Atwood as a person, yeah. and I like, you know, I like her, 
her, her stance on things and so on. And when she writes essays and that, I really like it. I'm just not crazy about her writing. And I've tried the Cat's Eye and a few of those. Yeah. Cat's Eye I loved. Yeah, and, and you I loved it, loved yeah. Some, a lot of them, but I did love that. Anne Marie MacDonald, Anne Marie MacDonald. Um, She's a good writer. Fall on Your Knees. Fall on Your Knees, I read that one right through. I mean, yeah, I good. the rest of her stuff is a good bit. It's good, but uh, that one was really good. The next one, As the Crow Flies, I couldn't finish it. I don't know many people who could. <laughs> oh, I just couldn't finish it. I was just... Lindy loves, I think Lindy loves, no? Yeah, Lindy loves all of her stuff, but most people, other people, <laughs> she, she was a one-hit wonder. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. she, that one was good. I mean, she was a friend of, Ju of her cousin Judas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carol Shields. Do you oh, remember? I liked Carol Shields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Several things of hers. Uh, what was the first one? Well, the first novel that really became famous, she'd written several books by this point, that won a bunch of prizes, was The Stone Diaries. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I know another one that you I read your copy was Margaret Lawrence. Oh, I love Margaret Lawrence. Yeah. Now, Margaret Lawrence would, I can go back, because that would have been 70s and 80s. Yeah. Uh, uh, Stone Angel. Yeah, I and, read your copy. Oh, I like I liked her a lot. I, she wrote other things, too, I think. It was kind of a loosely connected series. And Stone yeah. Angel was maybe the first. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there's a few, yeah. That's and we actually visited the Stone Angel in Manitoba. in Manitoba. Yeah, and I I was kind of shocked. I thought it would be a great big thing, and it was only about two and a half, three feet high. And that was yeah. the real that Stone was, Angel. That from was the, the novel. Stone Angel from the novel. And when did you discover Sharon Butella? In the eighties, I discovered Sharon Butella. I read the, her quite a few of hers. Um, I don't even remember the names. I remember Luna. I remember. But I've read it oh, pretty well everything she's written. Yeah. Gosh, Sean, it's a good thing that you remind me because I did read a lot of things. Oh, sure. You were a big, big, big reader. <laughs> um, you are a big, big reader, but you have been for a long time. Because we met her together at an event earlier this, early this year, mm -hmm. in the winter, and then I've had her on my channel since then. Yeah. And, and we, I mean, we have a connection with her in that she lived at East End for a long time, and that's where my mother was raised. As a kid, well, you maybe visited East End. We visited where my mother grew up because yeah. my uncle lived there and my aunt. And um, so we visited them all through, right through until the 90s. Mm -hmm. We visited them. Yeah, and so we had that connection with East End, too. So we had quite a visit with her. It was nice. It was fun. In Jan January or February of this year, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. or shall we move on to the 2000s? Uh, because I'm thinking, what did I read in the 2000s? Because I was still reading, I was reading a lot. What stands out in my mind? Oh gosh. I mean, Barbara Kingsolver was writing a lot then. I'm trying to think of who wrote On Air. Oh, Elizabeth Hay. Hayes. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hay. Hay. Oh, I like her. She's Canadian. She's Canadian. Helen Humphreys. Helen Humphreys. Uh -huh. Do you remember what, what what was the first one of hers that you liked? It was a. Uh, it, the garden in the um, yeah the lost garden the lost garden right, was the too. first one and I was probably the one of all of them I liked it the very best yeah where it was very good I liked it but I read pretty well everything else she's written yeah. and I and I like it mm -hmm. yeah I like her nonfiction very much I love the lost garden and her most recent novels have been a bit of a miss for me but you well too. there was one that was, yeah the fly fishing lady yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people. I'd love that one too, but not, not us. But I mean, I, I liked her nonfiction as well because I read one about apples and where they yes, came from. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and she wrote a whole one about her brother dying and what that was. And yeah, they yeah, were good. Yeah, the Frozen Towns. An important writer for both of us. Yeah. Of course, this last one, I've, yeah. I've gotten, I've gotten really caught up with Lucinda Riley. Yeah, and I think what we. You talked about that in another video, but we'll mention that, and I'll put a link to that. But there's another big Canadian mystery writer that you're a big fan of. Oh, Louise Penny. Louise How Penny. could I forget Louise Penny? Oh, I just love Louise Penny. Yeah. Whatever she writes, the minute it comes off the press, I get it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's all, uh, those are all, uh, they follow like those all follow the, but that's that's mysteries. And of course, 
I have to say what I like about her books is that each one kind of, it kind of raises up an issue uh, in society that's a big problem. And she writes it, of course, in fictional form. You know, she wrote about, uh, she's written about uh, the indigenous, how they've been so uh, dis disavowed and uh, the opioid crises. And, but she does it in fictional form so that you don't realize until afterwards that it's mental illness. She's done one on that. It's all the same characters in it, but it's there's an there's enough inter, uh, inter, introduction of other people in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The church, Catholic Church. You began your journey as kind of awakening your co consciousness about Indigenous issues in Canada long before me, and part of us, I think, an important parts of that have been meeting Indigenous writers over the years. Mm -hmm. You have a great story of was it Louise Half? <laughs> Tell that story. That was, when I, that was when I was in uh, university, and Louise Health, uh, she was a social worker. Poet. Yeah, uh, from, she was at Meadow Lake at that time. She lived at Meadow Lake, and she launched, her book was called Writing the Circle, and it was, uh, it was poetry. An anthology. It was an anthology, yeah, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of poetry yes. in it, yeah. I went to the, the launch with a friend, and now, then it was the Saskatoon News Agency. They don't have that anymore, but Louise was there. And, uh, you know, we were at the launch and listened to it, and I went up to her and, and told her how much I was appreciating the, you know, it's, it's, it's tough because she talks about what it's really like. And uh, she wrote into my, the, the anthology wasn't just her writing. No. That's right. No. It was, there were several writers. There was Blue Sky, and some, I think Blue Sky was there that night too, but Louise was the one that really, and she wrote in my book, to someone who sees beneath the skin, mm -hmm. thank you. And that was in 1989. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we had been doing a lot of work in the United Church on indigenous issues. Yes. I had sat at the table with elders at conference, at conferences and so on and started to, but I was still very naive to the whole residential school thing. That's taken many years. Like that's back thirty years now, and yep. Yeah. And it's become more and more and more. And I've kind of engaged myself in in reading and in being at events. And that's right. Mm -hmm. You started a lot earlier than the rest of us. And one of your favorite writers, we can't we can't leave him out of this video is Richard Wagamese. Richard Wagamese. Oh, yes. I just love his writings. I yes. I read everything he had to write. Some of his books were fictional. Some of it was bi mm -hmm. autobiographical. Uh, he passed away about seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Quite young, 50. 60, he was 62 okay. when he died. And he was Ojibwe, Anishinaabe Ojibwe from Ontario. But adopted, so didn't really work. Yeah, he was a 60. Knowing he, was, his, he was a 60 scoop kid. Yeah, that's yeah. where the government just willy nilly took. Yeah, it was babies. many years before he found his way back. When he found his way back to his grandfather, his grandfather could not, he couldn't, they couldn't converse because his grandpa spoke the language and he didn't. You well, almost had a chance to meet him because he was going to come to a church event that you were yeah, involved in. Yeah, he and was he and, and he got sick. Yeah. What book would, would you recommend people try of his to start for the first one? Well, maybe One, one Life, One... One Native Life? Right? One Native Life. That's Just, a good one to start uh, with. That's I think. the one of his that I really loved, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good one to start with. Now, you and I disagreed on the novel. Well, um, the yeah, book, and, there, and he didn't even really mention... Oh, I'm trying to think of it. It's about street people. Um, um, the lottery ticket or something? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, and he doesn't even mention that the people that are on the street were indigenous. He just, it's just, I love the book. So I really liked Richard Wagamese. Mm -hmm. I still like him. Mm -hmm. I use his little book, Embers, and uh, I just read a little clip of it if I'm really down because it just kind of gives me a Kind of like meditations or yep. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's a good book you've read recently? Don Dumont's What Doesn't Cry at Bingo? Nobody Cries at Bingo. Nobody Cries at Bingo uh, is really good. And the one that's really funny is the <laughs> the Chicken Dance Tour. Prairie Chicken the Dance. The Prairie Chicken Dance Tour. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I love I've that. talked about Don Dumont on my channel. She is an Indigenous writer based in Saskatoon, and she's been in the news in the last year b b to do with trying she, to keep her and her, her kids safe from an abusive, abusive settler Canadian 
partner. I won't get into any more than that, but anyway, she's gotten herself into trouble with the way that she handled that, but I, we support and believe her side of the story and are against the way the, the police narrative about all that. But as a writer, she's just absolutely fabulous. She I mean, she just writes about things and they're so humorous, <laughs> yeah. just so humorous. The Nobody Cries at Bingo is about reservation life and she writes it in a positive way. She didn't have a, you know, it's, it's I think there's autobi it's autobiographical in a way and because her mother was a teacher and so on and so forth, but yeah. I haven't read that one, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, it's good. <laughs> Great, well, mom, 80 years of reading. <laughs> What do you think you're going to specialize in in your eighth, ninth decade? <laughs> well, I've got a Sharon Butella book on my shelf that you gave me for yeah, my birthday. That Sharon Butella just came out with Wisdom, uh, Leaving Wisdom. I'm looking forward to it. Signed by Sharon Butella. Signed. Wishing you a happy 80th birthday. Yes, indeed. And that's going to be my next read. Yep. Reading different things. I read uh, Jan Arden's uh, Feeding My Mother. Um, What's that about? Jan Arden's feeding my mother. It's her diary of of her taking her of her life through the Alzheimer's disease. Her mom had Alzheimer's, and it's her diary of that mm -hmm. until her mom died. It's serious stuff, and yet she she writes it in a way that you know you can just pick it up and read it and understand. And that's one that I just finished, and I'm reading Sean's Peacock. The Peacock. The Peacock. By, um never remember her name but yeah we'll put the cover up a German novel set in Scotland yeah, and it's hilarious yeah, yeah. it's hilarious yeah. it's a translated novel mm -hmm. well I owe lots to my mom for uh, raising me as a avid reader so can I tell a story about when you were 12 years old oh I guess so <laughs> when you went to the library the witchcraft you, book you yeah <laughs> Sean ordered books from the library all the time he was a very avid library user at that point <laughs> And the librarian said to me, I don't think he should be ordering these books. This one's on witchcraft. <laughs> and I don't think he should be ordering. I don't think he should be reading about that. And I said to her, well, if he understands it and he gets something out of it, I don't think it's going to hurt him one bit. So she had to be quiet and let him take it home. So if you've ever wondered why Sean the Bookmaniac is so weird, it's because my mom was overly permissive. <laughs> 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 well, he That's was good... reading so much stuff. He was he was reading Enid Blyton and all that kind of stuff at that yeah. same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't worried about the mix. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Mom. All right. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.